Please come sit down so you can come to our hearing on the town garage. Okay, we are kicking this off. We have David Roy here, who's the architect of our proposed building. We have some members of the select board here that can answer questions. We have the road foreman, Guthrie Perry is here. So we're here to present you with the drawings, the estimates, and to answer questions. Um, so the proposal is for a new building on Templeton Road that's going to house all the town equipment. Right now, some of it has to sit outside. It's going to have enough room in it so we can maintain the equipment. It's going to upgrade the heating system and all the components within. It's going to be a beautiful building. It's, the proposed building is beautiful, well-designed, um, environmentally friendly, built with environmentally friendly materials, et cetera, et cetera. We've done all the assessments on the energy use. We have Andy Shapiro here, who's a town resident, who has helped with the design and to make sure that we're on track with the energy efficiency. Andy is here today, and he has uh, done an awesome job. And a true volunteer and just done great work, and he is here to answer questions and does a great job at that. So um, let's kick this off. Who's got any questions? Okay. <laughs> maybe a little, maybe a little quick, quick overview. Yeah, David, David Roy will be up and give you a um, Tracy had a question. Kick it off. Yes. My question is, um, do you use all of the town equipment at some point during the winter? Yes, mostly. Got through? The only, I would say the roadside owner pretty much the only one that's And the, the biggest variable in the equipment use is the weather. And you never know when storms come in, you're gonna need a truck, it can't be frozen up, it can't be sitting outside. Those, those, that equipment has to be ready to use, which means you gotta keep it inside. Um, outside storage does not work for this equipment, if you're gonna use it. And you never know when you're gonna need it. It could be freezing rain, all the sanders have to be out. It could be snowing a foot. So. That's the short answer to your question. Even just cold weather itself will freeze up the systems in the trucks. So yeah. They have to be inside. I was thinking about everybody's tractors, you know, that are just outside. Um, so so need... as a farmer, I'd rather have my tractors inside, <laughs> but I don't have enough storage. <laughs> so I'm picky. You know, I do have a heated shop, and the, the uh, equipment we're going to use goes in there when it's cold. But we don't have enough, on my farm, we don't have enough storage for everything. I wish we did. And, and you want to explain the radiant heat? Sure. Because yeah. Tracy wasn't in the garage. Yep. Um, so in the, in the floor itself, uh, it's all concrete slab, obviously. Um, we'll have uh, radiant tubing within the slab that keeps that concrete tempered to a degree. We're running 100, 110 degree water through it. Um, and that allows us to, it, it's a really good system for fire departments, municipalities, things that store large equipment, because as they bring the trucks in cold, it will slowly radiate that heat upwards to the vehicles, melt them off, and it keeps the actual floors remain pretty dry and clean as a result of that, because, because they're heated. So it's a really good system. Um, even if you open the garage door and some cold air comes in, that slab stays at a very moderate temperature consistently, and it helps to moderate the temperatures within the whole building pretty, pretty well. Um, so it's a really efficient system for this type of approach, and it's used almost ubiquitously uh, on these types of buildings. So we have some up there now, the right part of the building? Yeah, 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 the addition that was done in Oh wait, oh eight, yeah, is a radiant slab. Another another factor there also is rodents. Like I said, a, a nice tight building, you'll have far less mice and such. Yep. Yeah, so the rodents get inside, the machinery was parked outside, there's two on wires, 
and then that's a really bad thing because everything's electrical in the vehicles these days. So you get in the vehicle, you go to start it up, you start it maybe, and then you go, oh, I'm gonna raise the cloud. Oh, I'm gonna raise up today. Whoops, can't go out in the cloud, and so you need you now. Guess what, the mouse got in there somewhere and chewed off a wire somewhere, and uh, that's a nightmare. So being inside, great, great idea. Uh, in general, this, this building, although larger than what they currently have, it allows them access around the vehicles. Um, they're able to uh, maintain and operate and fix them up, clean them up more easily. Um, it allows all of them to be inside at one time. Uh, so there's six doors along the front of the building, and then one on the side, which will have the grader. Uh, so the grader and the you keep the lawnmower in the roadside yeah. during the winter. Yeah. And then we'll turn it around. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So these, these blocks define what the vehicles are, the length of the total vehicle, the width, and the zone around it is kind of the new, you know, the, the work area around the vehicle. This is the grader, and we can put the, the lawnmower inside back here would not be used over the winter four months. Um, the building will be fire protected. Um, we'll have two large storage tanks which, which uh, feed the fire protection system with a pump. Uh, and we'll also use those to condition the water uh, so that when we get to extreme cold times, we can actually pull heat from those to supply um, water to the floor for heat and maintaining that integrity in that slab. Uh, That's this big tank on the outside here. So we had looked, uh, we had looked at four different options for this building. We had air source heat pumps, pellet boiler, um, ground source heat pumps, and fossil fuels. And that one option was to have a pellet boiler here, which fed into the mechanical room. Uh, but we find the geo geothermal heat source is more attractive, both from a rebate standpoint, <coughs> from an availability of, of wood pellets um, and the ability to, to uh, feed that, and from uh, the rebate. Did I say that, the rebate already? Uh, the rebates uh, it's okay. available. It's OK to repeat yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then just from a long-term um, maintenance and operational standpoint, the geothermal system is also pretty desirable uh, in terms of its uh, you might want to explain what the geothermal is. Okay. Uh, so geothermal, for those of you who aren't quite familiar with it, we're taking, we're going to put um, multiple 500 foot deep wells out into the yard uh, in front of the building. And those wells, we're going to circulate water down into them and recapture the heat from the surrounding ground. <coughs> Uh, and use that heat to feed the building to, with energy. Um, the wells are spaced at 25 feet on center. So in essence, over time, as you, as you start to draw heat off them, that, that ground space starts to cool off throughout the winter. And then over the summer, it'll recapture that heat uh, in, the, in the ground, in the soil around it. Um, again, these are 500 feet deep, um, but it provides you an opportunity to pull all of your heat energy from the ground rather than using a fossil fuel or a wood pellet or anything like that. So, does everybody understand that? Or are you going to have a backup system? There's, <laughs> there's not because we've got thermal storage in these tanks. Uh, so there's. 20 to 24,000 gallons of water that will be tempered that we can utilize that will carry the building for quite some time. And that, that water goes through the tubing in the concrete. So that water is already heated. And then that goes through the tubes in the concrete. So we're, the concrete. Yeah. we're capturing, we're basically pulling water out of the ground taking heat out of it, and then re-injecting the water back into the ground. So the water goes back into the ground at a lower temperature. Meanwhile, you're storing the, the, the delta, that change in temperature, inside the building uh, for use in the radiant slab. So it's, 
I don't know if that explains it very well, but that's that's kind of the scientific approach to how we're looking at this. Those, uh, those two tanks would store about three million BTUs, mm -hmm. which would carry you through probably two or three of the coldest days of the year. Yep. What about a power outage? <clears throat> so we we actually looked at um, the reliability. Well, number one, this is a very thermally efficient building, so it's well insulated um, and it should carry itself for quite some time, especially with the thermal water storage and the and the slab itself. We looked at the reliability, uh, and there were only minutes that the power was out for any time over the past six years. I think we looked at it. And I am aware that you had a period of time that you were out for days. We could bring in a backup generator and help um, operate the facility in that manner if there's a, if there's a really long-term pronounced uh, loss of power. It's right, the power comes right off the big three-phase yeah. line that Washington Electric has. It's one of their main lines. Yeah. So those are the ones that get uh, fixed first. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still like that the generator. Yeah. yeah. Well, the nice thing about that, if you were just pulling heat out of those two tanks yeah. for a couple of days, it'll take a very small generator to run the yes. circulators for the. It take a bigger one to run the, the, the whole building. Yeah. Yeah. So the intent is the building is efficient enough that we can carry the building for days without without having true heat. Yeah, but what about lights and stuff like that? I have to have a generator. Yeah. But I know, I know someone has three of them very close. <laughs> I mean, this is what we've done in the past. Is we've had a new generator around town to operate this and that. So that is a thought that we probably ought to have some kind of generator open the doors and put on lights. So yeah. that's, that's, that's in the thought process. That we're, we not can't go out of something like that. Not a huge, huge expense. Not a huge expense, no. But, but. It's really just setting up panels for yeah. You just have to get the connection more. Yeah, and you know I tell people to hotwire. Anyway, the transfer switch is a great idea. That should be in there, and then you're all set. You just plug in and go. Yep. Yeah. We do have the we do have the school bond that was mentioned that's, that's going to roll off for five years. So that's going to take that's going to take a load right off the off of our tax bill. Um, we've mentioned numerous times the positive about attracting and maintaining employees with it, with the new building rather than the antiquated, cold whatever that we currently have. So, Dave, could you speak about the cost of just delaying it a year or two? Yeah. Or five. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, um, five years is a lot. Um, so I was talking, speaking earlier, just rough order of magnitude, we've seen prices of construction double between 2017 and now. And it's, it's been an extraordinary time of escalation. Um, over the last couple of years, um, we've seen, uh, I'm gonna say 2022 and 23, we saw escalation in the six, six and a half percent range across the board on a lot of building materials and such. Um, we're now planning on about two and a half percent to delay things for a year. So if you look at two and a half percent on a million dollars is 25,000. It is. Yeah. Um, Compounded. Yes, yeah. 2,000, million, million 25,000 times two percent, if that's the next rate. Yeah, exactly. It's not just yeah. on the same million. Yeah, so uh, the, the million becomes, well, yeah. it'd be $125,000 kind of premium to wait a year. Uh, and that's probably pretty ambitious. Uh, and then obviously the further we wait out, the, that continues to escalate at that rate. It's a little bit of an assumption, but we're, um, that's kind of the going uh, assumption right now. It's about 2.5% will be the next annual increase in, in costs for construction. So is is anybody interested in the impact and the tax rate? Because I don't mind going through that if anybody has any questions. Because that's really the bottom line in this whole thing is how it affects your taxes. 
So if there's any questions about that, I can answer them or help answer them. We're also considering whether it should be a 20-year bond or a 30-year bond. Yeah. I mean, at some point, you're going to need a new building. So if you want to wait, if we, if we, if this didn't pass and we came back in five years. Yeah. Well, I also want to point out, I mean, we've got a lot of what we what we call as contingencies. We have planned for everything that, that Guthrie and crew needs to operate 50 years using a highly efficient building. We've also got contingency built into that, and that's for unknowns that we might find as we continue to develop the project. It is not fully designed at this time. Um, so those contingencies also add up considerably to the cost of this. Um, if we can avoid having to dip into those contingency funds, we're obviously gonna look to do that. So we'll continue to refine the design and look to ways to save, to bring that conservative number down as much as we can um, so that the ultimate cost maybe is four and a half million, maybe it's 4.2 million. I don't, we don't have a hard number yet, uh, but we're working to, to bring that number down. And we do this on all projects. We have to kind of assume a worst case scenario. And as we continue to progress, we'll find ways to, uh, to deliver it, hopefully at a lower cost. Uh, and we'll have to work with trade partners, contractors, and others to do so. so. But you, know, you had mentioned the garage that people weren't here that because it's a wood building, the competition um, or, or the bidding process may be a lot yeah, more competitive. It's, it's more open to a lot more contractors are capable of doing a wood frame structure versus a steel structure. So uh, it might open it up to more competitive bidding opportunities and such. It's also a better building envelope. We can insulate it more appropriately and air seal it better than we could a wood frame, uh, a steel building. Um, so all those things, we're trying to factor all those th things into the building. Looks like you got a total of about 15% in all the computers. Yeah, yeah. How, how does that compare with what you see in terms of what happens, actually? Um, whew. A lot of variables in that. Yeah. Um, so like I said, we tried to plan for every eventuality of what we would need in our base construction number. And like you said, there's about 15%. As we move forward in the design, uh, through design development and construction documents and other things, we will reduce that contingency as we, as we learn more about how we're gonna approach things. We're gonna learn more about the septic system, about this underground soils, how do we deal with storm water, uh, other things that aren't identifiably clear at this moment. Um, and then also we have to know like how many wells we have to do because we have to do thermal conductivity tests because uh, that'll determine how, how well the, the ground, the surrounding ground transfers heat to the well. So a lot of those things will determine, and as we determine them, we'll either use that contingency to address those issues, or we'll reduce the contingency, hopefully both, um, and, uh, and, and eventually come to the end where we'll have a final number. The end, when I say the end, that's when we bid the project out, likely in February or March of next year. We'll know, we'll have a really good number um, to work with. Um, that is, again, hopefully much less than what we have planned for right now. So. Okay, I guess I have a question. Uh, bond, you want five million? Well, I'm asking for that what we're voting on? That's what we're, that's the... But that doesn't mean we're going to spend. Before. Right, that's the figure. That's what we're saying. A lot of projects you see, they'll say, oh, it's going to cost five billion. The people voted in, and oh, it's easy. This went up, and that then, went then, up. Then we, then we can't build a building. Yeah, it's only can. So we've got a plan for construction. We built in escalation into our numbers for next year. <coughs> Beyond that, we don't have. So if it comes in at seven billion, we don't have a building. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, yeah. I understand. I'll, 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 I'll be facetious. I'll in that extra money. If we go five million, that's it. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's it. Yeah. We, <coughs> Four point nine. We don't plan to come back to the bank for anything. Yeah. The bank's pretty much yeah. dry. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. This, this is 5.4, so the rest of that half a million is coming from? Capital reserve. Capital reserve. So we have some our, our money left, and we can put that into the project if we had to. If we did. Which we've already, we've already used ARPA money, um, up, uh, already used that for the initial cost to get an idea, so the renderings and that kind of stuff. So that's, that we, that's a reduced cost that we would have had to factor in. Uh, so these guys here, we took that ARPA money. Yeah. We just don't want to see any surprises. No, no. We don't want to stop the road. We underestimated. But if the, if the voters approve the 4.9 bond, we have authority to spend up to that, or to borrow up to that. And that's it. And we're hoping not to use it. So the highest um, tax increase would be in line with that sheet, which is almost nine cents. Uh, if we go with a 30 year bond added to the 262 or whatever it is now, the municipal tax rate is around 60 something cents. And that's what actually the town has control of. They have no control of the school tax rate. And just to give some, because I've, I've only been on for a couple of years, but our select board and our head select board, we, we argue about details about spending too much for a computer or whatever very fiscally conservative and responsible. And if it wasn't for the school budget, then our, our you know, the tax rate went up very, couple just cents. a couple of cents just in, in inflation and that kind of stuff in employees. But we're really <laughs> very tight persons and, and really, really can, we, we argue about, we, we talk about every, every cost and it's, it's our money too. So we're going to be hammering. <coughs> and I don't know if you were, we also hired um, a company to watch out for our costs, the building, and to make sure that we're getting the best deal rather than just say, put it out to bid, just put it out to bid. They're going to be reviewing and saying, well, maybe we can do this or that. They're looking at it for, for our best needs also to protect us, almost like a G. A GC is working for us. It's a clerk of the works. Okay, thank you. It's, thank it's, you. it's, it's more technology. Yeah. Okay, so I don't want to spend any more money either, trust me. <laughs> so on the tax rate, I just like to do these that a little bit. Sure. So um, right now we're projecting for 30 years, it would go up close to nine cents. So that means $90 on $100,000 for the assessment. And if everyone's house, if your house is 400,000, that'd be 360 bucks a year. Uh, but we're going to drop the um, emergency services building off our bill in five years. That's five cents on the tax rate right now. So at the end of five years, the five cents will be gone. And the bond payment will also decrease over time. It's less money every year. So, you know, the year coming up might be the toughest year to pay the taxes, but the impact will soften over time. Same idea as the fire stick. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Same idea. Yeah, and the interest rates have dropped. We keep shopping around the interest rates, and they're still competing for our business, so it's dropped more since we just talked about it. So that's really good. I mean, it was 14 cents on the tax rate when we first started getting into this. Now it's down to nine, and it could drop some more. And if the cost of the building drops a little bit, you know, you could be looking at seven or eight cents, or seventy dollars on a hundred thousand dollars assessment. Yeah, our, our last meeting, there's there's somebody in town, wherever that uh, was the Vermont Loan Fund or something. We we got in contact with them, and they said, sure. And she was on. We had anybody could have attended the meeting, and she was on for 15, 20 minutes, and her. Competitive was what a, a third of a percent less or something, which is we're talking about real money. So we're continually looking to save our money. This is my money too. So I'm not spending yours. I'm spending sure. mine too. But it's just it's really critical, and I'm trying to get get the word out. So to, to me, the only downside of this whole thing is it's expensive, and what impacts people on the negative side is the expense your tax bill. The positive side of it is you have a great building, an opportunity to build it now before expenses go up. And um, it's an incentive to keep our road crew and also get 
new employees <coughs> hire, which we'll have to do. Um, and, you know, it's a well-designed building. It's energy efficient. We've had, we have had a great crew designing it, and all systems look great. It's just the downside is the expense, but the expense isn't that big on your tax bill, and it will get less. So if you can get the word out. Could you just give like, two, a couple of, just a, a brief explanation about the, the maintenance of the trucks, the, the, the length of use of a truck, just by not having it parked outside and be able to maintain it inside? Which is critical because these trucks are not, it's not a F-150 for 60,000. So the current life range of a town plow truck uh, is 10 years in full use. And then it'll be a couple of years beyond that, it will be a spare truck. Um, that's our projected the, the use. Projected use, right. And that's because we've actually pushed that bigger. Yeah. We've tried to extend the life of the vehicles. And to the garage, you can maintain them with a bigger space, much more readily. Right now, they're all crammed in there like sardines. You can't even walk around them. So it makes maintenance challenging on a daily basis. And there are days where the road crew doesn't have to be out there plowing and salting. So what they do is they do maintenance. So with an up-to-date facility that can get around the trucks and have equipment to do it, their maintenance is going to ramp up considerably. And that's important because we extended the life of these extended of these trucks as long as we could within acceptable limits. And you know, I've been on the select board long enough to know, hey, let's make this truck last 10 years. We can do it. But the way you do it is by maintenance. So this is a key um, component in that whole thing. Is maintenance, taking care of your equipment, being able to clean it, get the salt off it, grease it, keep it in a warm building. Those are all things that extend the life of vehicles. And have road equipment, fire equipment, or anything. We got to how much? Just off the top of your head, how much? What's the what's the dollar the dollar value of the equipment that we that we currently have? I mean, a million dollars, eight hundred thousand. Well, four ten wheelers to replace them right now would be a million dollars for the four of them. Uh, you've got a six wheeler, bucket loaders, one hundred seventy five minimum. I think one seventy eight. Might as well call it two hundred by the time you actually. Get one a million and a half dollars. Oh, it, yeah. Or e yeah. A Easily. million and a half dollars. If you oh, can extend two, that one year. No, or two. Be more than that. The greater is another half. Right. Two million dollars. If you can extend every year, you extend the life of that truck is <laughs> that that's, that's points. That that certainly points on uh, on your taxes. That we don't have to buy another truck. We don't have to buy a two hundred thousand dollar truck for another two years. So that's it's cost effective. That's I yes and the so same thing with pulling like the bucket loader I've talked that we end up pulling that out for so many days in the winter so we have room to actually work in that end of the shop so it sits outside if it's ten degrees or cold we'll go ten below well it has to run for an hour well that's an hour of warranty that went out the window when it's fairly new that's it, it's not it it all adds up to wear and tear none of the new emissions want you idling to begin with it's it's hard on the equipment, even just sitting outside the idle while getting it warm for a few hours or an hour, so it can sit up there for a few more hours and still be able to come back in. So, it's... Talk to your neighbors. <laughs> if you're in the next seven years, I think you're gonna see a total turnover in that road crew, too. That's and uh, the air quality in that building, as it is today, sucks. <laughs> Point blank. Uh, when you start those trucks or the equipment, uh, and I think it will add a little bit of an advantage when we go to higher quality people. Uh, are they recommended any type of exhaust system? We are. There's a there's there's going to be two part system. There's sensors that we're going to put in, which are monitor air quality, uh, and those will kick off. Air, uh, kick on ventilation systems uh, to ventilate the, when those levels reach a certain amount, it'll kick on. What's in the old building for exhaust? We have one 18 inch exhaust fan on the new end, the OAM. And that just pulls air out? Yeah. yeah. So improved air quality is gonna be big. Oh yeah, absolutely. We're dissipating a lot of heat too. Yeah. People might have fresh air coming in, you know, to every day, every day, every day. Generation. Yeah. that's one of the things they're looking for. Yeah. Well, 
one is just one way there. It's fire department. They have a hole as it goes through these exhausts back. The direct connect. Yeah. 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 There's pros and cons to that. We don't have that plan. Right. Yeah. yeah. The exhaust fans will run if the humidity gets too high, if there's fuel vapors in the air, yeah. carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide, and it'll just run long enough to clear all that out. And the way they got it set up is the intakes are down low, so that cold outside air will come running across that warm floor, and that's what's going to heat the incoming air. So you don't have to have a whole separate system for that. No, I'm just curious if that was factored in. It is, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's not one of those plug onto the exhaust pipe yeah. systems. Any more questions? I have a question. Yes, sir. Is there a plan B if the vote doesn't pass? Um, no. I mean, the, we, we'd have, the plan B would get maybe in a year or two or three come up with another More bond time. issue. I mean, we don't have $2 million, $3 million in a capital fund to say, okay, they didn't, the voters turned it down. <clears throat> we have extra money. Well, I have a <coughs> I've had conversations with many people and uh, there seems to be general concern about the, the presidential election. And a lot of people are, are concerned about spending. And uh, I haven't pinned anyone down or anything. I haven't had any conversations. So, the, well, you're not going to vote for this because of that. But it, it may be possible that um, this won't pass because of that. And because of participation? No, because people are afraid to spend any money right now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I can add. Yeah. Because of the uncertainty of um, our national situation. And so um, I'm wondering if we could like, maybe circle back in, in, a, in a month or two and have another stab at it if it doesn't go. Well, then that's a thought, and we could do that. You could come back in March. I don't know. I'm, I'm just throwing something out. <laughs> no, I mean, if you're worth yeah. thinking about. I mean, we could have a vote every six months, but the point is, if it would, is that the main reason why people are voting it down? We could try to get a census. We were trying to do it in November because that's when you get the greatest. Yeah, we've already, already had 50 percent, 59 percent of the people in these months have already, voted. already voted. That's great. I mean, Rose, Rose has got the participation. participation. You. And you're expecting to see the total percentage of the voters? I, I suspect between 75 and 80 percent participation for this particular election. Which is pretty amazing. Yeah. But that's the, you know, moving to mail in ballots, mail in ballots to every household each month there, I think has been a factor. More, more participation. It's pretty awesome for, 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 for this city, for this town of East Montpelier to get 75 or 80 percent. Yeah, because nationally to come out. out now. Oh, it's awesome. I mean, yeah. democracies. We really still haven't had voting. So we haven't right, had no, voting today, and we're at 40 votes. Rosie said this is pretty normal, though. She yeah. said it's normal. Yeah. Not before we started mailing ballots to people. Well, I'll just say not. Maybe normal by these well, days. Obviously. Yeah. Anyway. So that's where we're at. I mean, we've had lots of debates about could we, at this election, could we come in with. Do we need a building that could be four and a half, 4.9, 4.3? Can we have a building that would only cost us two million? Well, no, <laughs> it doesn't look like that. I, I don't want a 4.9, 4.3 million dollar building. I want a building that's a million or two. But this is we, you know, this is not one square mile. These small building, a large geographical area with four road crew and seven trucks. So. This is, none of this has been taken lightly at all. And we are fiscally conservative. Is that, is that correct, Mr. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, <laughs> sir. I always try to agree with him. I'll show my party. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. I'm a blue dog Democrat, which means I'm fiscal conservative. <laughs> um, yeah, sir. As most of us are. So that's kind of where we're at. And, uh, but to answer your question, we'll, 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 if it gets turned down, we will definitely think about all the options. And that's an option that we could put it out for a revolt. But the amount of money isn't really going to go down. The only way we could make it like is take all the money out of the capital reserve, which we're saving for trucks and paving, et cetera, et cetera. So 
I guess that could be an option, but that's not an option I really want. No. And the building is really designed for their needs. I mean, yeah. kind of scope is. Oh yeah. You you have a, another battle in ten years over what you know right. the shortcomings for the building. Right. It's going to be doubled. So yeah. we hope you just give it careful consideration as as we have. We we get it. But I really think that the biggest thing is your bill. If the taxes, well, it's, it's the your tax bill. It's the only thing. But the tax bill it isn't going to be that bad. I mean, we're working on getting it down all the time. So when we get time, when we get done at the end of the day, it may only be seven or eight cents, which is only seven or eighty dollars per hundred thousand. So just do the math. If you live in a four hundred thousand dollar house, that's you know. 350, 400 bucks, not that much. I know it does have an impact. It does have an impact. That's money, that's money. Yeah, that's money. Anyway. But it will get less, so. That's where we're at. I hope you'll seriously consider it and talk to your neighbors. And uh, Tracy? Just for the road crew, I'm sorry? Um, I have a road maintenance question. Yeah, go, sure, got to be here. I, I don't know what time frame makes sense, but have the costs of maintaining the roads increased and do you expect that to keep increasing so, given I don't the, know the main places and, uh, yeah. the main places that we've increased in the last two years is culverts, which by demand and it's still a plastic, so it's subject to controlling inflation. Um, Tires, that was a huge one. Uh, and as far as the actual price of gravel, the price of sand, the price of salt, they all saw increases, but not nothing that was where, oh, we need 10% on that right now, or 20%, a big increase to keep up. Uh, it's something that we could absorb over three to five years. I was thinking more of the need for repairs and maintenance because of environmental changes. So more or less what we've done in the last two years is less regular maintenance and more repairing, but the repairs we're doing are mitigating future problems that would be consistent with what we've had in the last two years. So, so out of, I don't even know how many culverts we changed in the summer of 23, um, none of those overtopped in 24. Being water didn't come over. Yeah. Right, water didn't come over them. Um, they were all sized appropriately. Um, meaning, which there's a lot, it, this is way off the town garage side of things, but uh, there's, a, there's a lot of process that goes into that being upsized through FEMA. So some of it takes time. That's the, you're dealing with a federal entity and then all of a sudden they need one little niche thing that you took care of almost a year ago, in all honesty, so you have to go dig that up and find it for them. Uh, so a lot of the repairs that have been done, I actually think as FEMA finally, hopefully, starts sending money our way, we should actually be able to recoup, recoup some of the places where we've spent money out of the regular yearly funds, and it'll back, I don't know where it'll end up going to general, I'm assuming. Um, we'll figure it out. Yeah. I mean, there's, the Sanders Circle project is a, a prime example of one that yeah. FEMA said, once you accept the bid, it's going to be 50% of that bid up front. And right. they haven't sent a penny yet, and right. they're gonna work on the second half of the culvert next week. Yeah, <laughs> 55,000. I don't think FEMA has any well, money. Well, is about a half a million dollar repair, but FEMA will reimburse us for all that. So country and road crew have done a lot of work, you know, with all the storm stuff that will be reimbursed by the team. But you know, in some ways we've done a good job with all the storms and stuff because we haven't really hired too many outside contractors to take care of some of the games and some of the roads. It, but some towns have spent billions of dollars, but they didn't have enough damage. But still, you know, road crews pretty much taken care of what's happened. So um, that's you know, with climate change. What he's saying there, there are to, to bring it back to what you're saying, yeah. in the summer of 24, more or less, FEMA is going to reimburse all yeah. a, a lot of the hours that were worked, a lot of the truck time that were worked. Yeah, there should be funds coming back. Right, for hours in theory, we would have been working anyway. 
and the right. trucks would have run to some extent. So we didn't have to we, pay. We didn't hire any contractors. That's the point. You have to pay. We hired outside. one. For you have to pay the outside contractors. We hired one for twenty four. We didn't hire any for twenty three. Yeah. That's huge. Will be reimbursed for all of our. And that's basically because Guthrie and the town administrator are together and they do a lot of big work to try to get <laughs> A lot of work. A lot of work. It's a lot of work. But, you know, they did a great job playing the back end because of this documentation they've done. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Anyway. That's they have done a good job them. maintaining the roads. I do also all over the state of Vermont. And my job. And they have to say that the roads in these are probably in better shape than 99% of the way around. Okay. 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 Yeah, right. Let's talk about the building because that, that's really what I'm concerned with. I'll be happy to talk to you with one or more of my Yeah, you can have private conversations with Tom. Or I can, anybody. Bring, I can bring it back to them. And, yeah. and if you ever have questions and stuff, we, we have public comment at the beginning of our select board meetings. And if there's questions and, and Guthrie's available and he wants, because we Zoom the meetings, and if there's, there's some issues, please let us know ahead of time. And if Guthrie's available and, and, and can do that. That's what we're here for. That's what Guthrie's here. He's so accessible. And if you have a question, either directly or otherwise, seriously, um, because he, he's got lots of extra time. He loves to just hang around <laughs> and just, just shoot the shit up like this. Yeah, most afternoons he's playing poker. They're playing poker in the, in the break room with the donkeys. But any more questions about the bill? Okay. And the bond, if we, if we apply for bond. The expense to taxpayers. Any questions about that? Nothing? Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all your questions. We have 10 people. So, this is the fourth hearing meeting we've had about the town ride. And we've tried to reach out to voters. One of the select board members wrote a letter, sent out to all the households. Because we're trying to get people on board with this project and to know what they are voting on. That's important. Because it's a need, we want everyone to know what the need is. Not just vote no, because it's gonna cost money. It does cost money, but it's a huge need. So this is the meeting, this is the fourth one we've had. We haven't had a lot of people, but thank you for coming and spread the word. And we can spread the word. And if there's any questions, you can get a hold of any one of us.